minutes. We're going to get started. My name is Benjamin Powell. I'm the director of the Free Market Institute here at Texas Tech University. Uh, the Free Market Institute's mission is to promote the study and teaching of free market economics uh, here at Texas Tech to students, other faculty, and the general public. As part of that mission, we sponsor or co-sponsor public events on campus for people to attend. This is going to be the last of those that we're involved with this semester, uh, but we already have a great lineup set up for next year, the first of which will be world-famous economist and syndicated columnist Walter Williams, who will be here on September 19th for our first event. Uh, if you're not already on our mailing list and would like to get on it, see either myself or, or Chuck Long. Chuck, raise your hand more vigorously afterwards, and we'll get you on our mailing list so you know about other upcoming events. <laughs> Um, I'm particularly pleased that we're able to co-sponsor this event with the Institute for the Study of Western Civilization. Both that institute and the Free Market Institute are new within the last 12 months here at Texas Tech, and this is the first event that we've been able to co-sponsor together, but I'm confident it will not be the last. There'll be many more of these to come. Uh, I'm also particularly <coughs> pleased uh, that we have a debate today. Um, the debates are so much fun because uh, you get both sides presented to you and the audience can form their own opinion, but it's also more exciting than most of academia. I mean, you write a journal article, you submit it, months later you hear something. By the time it comes out in print, you're tired of it. It's so anticlimactic. Uh, a public lecture helps a little bit, but if you've given it before, it gets to be old hat and you've heard the questions that will come. Debate gives you more drama. I grew up with athletics, and there's no like academic equivalent really to like the last 30 seconds in the basketball game. We just had a great NCAA championship last night. I don't know if we've got a Luke Hancock up here uh, to hit a bunch of threes for us, but this is about as close as academics get to it is having a, having a debate format. Uh, so I'm particularly pleased to have that. And um, uh, at this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Steve Balch, the director of the Institute for Western Civ, who really did all the work in organizing and setting up this event and had the idea for it. And he'll give you the ground rules on how the rest of this is going to proceed. Steve. Well, thank you. That was a rousing introduction, and like a good dinner, uh, after you have a really spicy uh, kind of course, you, you then have to have something that's sort of cold, limpid. And that's, that's my part of the, of the introduction. Um, I, I run the uh, Institute for the Study of Western Civilization, like the Free Market Institute, a uh, new kid uh, on the block. Um, we are interested in the big, broad questions. Uh, about the nature, origins, and future of Western civilization. Uh, and it's in that spirit uh, that we are going to address uh, this, the question that, that divides our, our two debaters today. Uh, before we get to that, uh, in addition to, uh, again, uh, giving my thanks to the Free Market Institute and to Ben, uh, I'd also like to thank the Charles Koch Foundation, uh, which provided the funding. Uh, for this debate. Um, it's a debate, but I would also like to think of it as an educational experience, uh, one in which the clash of divergent viewpoints uh, leads to mature reflection, uh, to uh, provocative stimulation, to something that you can take away. Um, we're passing out uh, questionnaires um, which are meant to measure the educational success of this venture. Um, they are anonymous, but you can put your name down on them if you'd like. Uh, we're going to take a look. We're going to share them with the folks at Coke who are very interested uh, in the impact uh, of the events, uh, the impact that the events they're sponsoring are having. Um, so please, uh, at the end of the debate, of course, that's when you have to fill it out after you've actually seen what has occurred uh, at the end of the debate, if you could uh, give them back to us. Uh, we very much appreciate that. Um, this is a kind of special debate uh, about the welfare state, maybe taking place uh, appropriately the day after the passing of, of Margaret Thatcher, whose domestic political career in many ways was devoted to dissolving the edifice of the welfare state in Britain. Um, she changed a great many things, uh, but I think it's fair to say uh, that the British welfare state is still there. So the question before us is, um, will it be there for a very long time to come, or built into the structure of the welfare state, uh, are there forces that eventually will undermine it, bring it down, or at least lead to its substantial alteration? Um, we're not especially interested in this debate, 
as to whether the welfare state is a good or bad thing on moral grounds, uh, on grounds of social justice. Uh, I think our speakers have pretty decided opinions about that and will probably express them, and it's certainly okay that they can do that. But what we're most interested in here uh, is whether, first off, uh, welfare state type policies um, are such as to kill the golden goose. That would sort of be the argument uh, skeptical of the welfare state's future. Um, do they undermine, destroy the economic engine that produces the goods that the welfare state then in part distributes? Or, on the contrary, is the welfare state an indispensable force, or, or at least an important force, uh, in sustaining productivity and economic <coughs> growth? Uh, I believe our speakers are going to have somewhat different views uh, on that question. Uh, a second and related question uh, is political viability. Uh, does the welfare state lend itself, because it's taking place in a democratic and politically competitive environment, uh, does it lend itself or does it encourage over-promising? Uh, do you get into a situation where more is promised than can be delivered? Not because perhaps the welfare state has to be that way, but because it works out that way in a democratic setting. Uh, and is that a potential danger to the welfare state? And of course, there are many different, let us be clear, welfare states in the world in many different countries, uh, and they have not all had the same experience, uh, and that perhaps will be brought forward uh, in this discussion. Um, so, uh, the question at hand is a kind of practical question, the viability of a particular model. Um, the format of debate will be more or less as follows. Uh, we will begin uh, by having uh, Michael Tanner uh, of the Cato Institute uh, talk against the proposition that the welfare state is viable. He's a welfare state skeptic, speak for 15 minutes. Uh, we will then have uh, Peter Lindhurt, uh, who is um, optimistic about the welfare state uh, as a model uh, for political economy. Uh, and he will speak 15 minutes on his side. Following that, uh, each uh, of our two debaters will have an opportunity for a five-minute rejoinder. Uh, then we will open the question up to the floor. Uh, and then in the last seven or eight minutes, uh, each of our two participants will have an opportunity to close. Michael Tanner first and Peter Lindhardt having the last word. So let me first introduce uh, Michael Tanner. Um, Michael Tanner, some of you may know him from his columns and, and public writing, uh, is a senior fellow at the Cato Institute, which you probably also know is a libertarian public policy think tank located in Washington. Uh, he heads the Cato Institute's research into a number of domestic policy areas, most especially health care reform, social welfare policy, and social security. He, is most, he most recently co-edited uh, a book called Replacing Obamacare, uh, the Cato Institute in Health Care Reform. He's the author of many other publications and books, including Leviathan on the Right, How Government Conservatism Brought Down the Republican Revolution, which appeared in 2007, and The Poverty of Welfare. Helping Others in a Civil Society, which appeared in 2003. His op-eds have appeared in, in many major public uh, venues and newspapers. Uh, he does a regular column for National Review Online and uh, can be seen quite often on a cable and network TV. Um, he also heads the Cato Project on Social Security Choice and Congressional Quarterly, none other than Congressional Quarterly has named him as one of the nation's five leading experts on Social Security. So with that, let me uh, hand the floor over to Michael Tanner for his opening statement. Well, thank you very much. I, I want to express my appreciation to, to Texas Tech and to the uh, groups that brought us here. I uh, really appreciate this and, and give you a chance to, to see a little bit of your campus today, and it's lovely. 
Although I will say, don't quite let that go to your head. See, I both live and work in Washington, D.C., so I always consider every place else lovely. <laughs> uh, I'm afraid I'm going to talk real fast here because I have way too many slides uh, for a 15-minute presentation. So I'm going to see how many of them I can get through. Uh, so I'll try to move as quickly as I can without being too confusing. Uh, basically, I want to talk about five reasons why I think the welfare state is due. Uh, the first of these is quite simply that the welfare state is unaffordable. You know, it's fitting we're here the day after Margaret Thatcher's death. Mark Maggie Thatcher, of course, famously once said, the problem with socialism is eventually you run out of other people's money. And that's largely what we're doing here with our current welfare state in the United States. This is a... This is a look at the projected from the CBO, the projected budget deficits that we are facing going forward. Uh, you can see that uh, we are currently uh, at a downward slope for the next few years as the, uh, basically as TARP and uh, the stimulus work their way through the budget and come out the other end. But then once the entitlement programs, Medicare, Medicaid, Social Security really begin to kick in uh, about halfway through the, this decade, uh, you see them start taking off again, and we eventually get to uh, levels of budget deficits that are clearly unsustainable uh, as we move forward. If you want to put this in the context of national debt, we, of course, have about $16.6 .6 trillion national debt right now. Uh, that puts us in the company of countries like Ireland and Portugal uh, worse off than, say, than Belgium. Uh, we have a pretty substantial uh, debt going forward. It's 103 percent, our national debt's 103 percent of our GDP. So we actually owe more than the value of all the goods and services that are produced in this country over the course of a year. Uh, but that's only part of the debt, because that doesn't actually count the uh, unfunded liabilities that go with programs like Social Security and Medicare. If you actually wanted to include them as part of our debt, and we do owe you know, the benefits going forward unless we make some changes to the law, so if we continue our welfare state the way it is currently under current law, uh, we owe about 900 percent, or about 800 percent of GDP uh, in terms of, that's the discounted present value. Uh, so if we had, uh, it's about 130, 140 trillion dollars. So if we had 130, 140 trillion dollars that you could sock in the bank today at a 3 percent interest rate, uh, we'd have enough money to pay all the shortfall uh, in these programs going forward. I would suggest you, can, you know, just have to look at these and wonder whether we can continue to support the welfare state we have, whether you can pay that off going forward, whether it is affordable. Uh, if you think we can get there simply by taxing the rich, I always like this slide here. Uh, over here, if you want, on the, far, on the, uh, the uh, sort of middle grade program right there, that's the 16.7 percent, seven trillion dollar public debt we have right now, 103 uh, percent of GDP. Uh, the slides on the far, the graphs on the far left are the more optimistic and pessimistic scenarios for the total indebtedness, including the unfunded liabilities of Social Security and Medicare, uh, as they say, go up to 9.5% of GDP. The far purple bar, the little one on the far right over there, my far right, that is the total wealth of all millionaires and billionaires in America. So, you know, let's skip off just the, uh, the idea of raising taxes on the rich. Let's just confiscate it. Let's take it all, every penny owned by every millionaire and billionaire in America, which you could only do once. Uh, and if we did that, you wouldn't come close to paying what we actually owe uh, going forward. In fact, according to the Congressional Budget Office, uh, for currently scheduled spending, assuming we never have another government program added to this, just the spending that is currently scheduled, uh, in order to pay for that, we'd have to increase the, both the corporate income tax rate and the top personal income tax rate to 88 uh, percent, raise the 25 percent income tax rate to 63 percent, and the 10 percent income tax rate to 25 percent, and that would pay for current scheduled government spending, assuming that we had no additional government spending going forward. I would submit that the welfare state's unaffordable. Second, uh, with the question is, the welfare state's incompatible with economic growth. Uh, you know, Certainly, we all agree that some level of government is necessary. I mean, you need to be able to adjudicate disputes, you need to defend property. Uh, some, there's some infrastructure programs, some levels of government investment that are good. And as you begin to spend on these sorts of, of government investments, the GDP tends to rise. But at some point, the burden of government becomes too heavy, 
and you begin to lose uh, productivity for the more government that you impose. In fact, there's been a number of studies uh, of this. Uh, go back to Robert Barrow looking and examining at these studies has determined that there's a significant negative relation between the growth of real GDP and the growth of government's share of GDP. The more government begins to consume uh, of GDP, the slower GDP grows. And as I say, a number of studies uh, of this. Uh, here's uh, some of the major ones, uh, basically showing what happens with a 10% increase in government expenditures. Uh, you can see they reach different conclusions about how much that affects, how negatively that affects government growth, but they all find that it does lead to negative uh, or slower growth in GDP uh, when you increase the size of government. As government grows, GDP growth tends to slow down. In fact, you can look at what the World Bank has said. Uh, they looked at growth in countries by, based on government size. They found that those with the smallest government, with governments less than a 25% share of GDP, uh, they grew at nearly 7%, but those governments that had a 55% share or larger, they were growing at barely 2% of GDP, just over 2% of GDP. So there was a clear relationship between the size of government and the amount of economic growth you get in society, uh, get out of an economy. Uh, so if we're going to increase the size of government, you're going to get less economic growth. This is uh, in the United States. Uh, this chart shows the, uh, the red line is uh, government spending. Uh, the blue line is private GDP growth. This is the variation from the mean uh, for both of these. Uh, and what you can see is they work in, you know, contrapunctally. When uh, one goes up, the other goes down. As you get more, uh, as you get more government spending, once again, government, uh, the economic growth tends to decline. Uh, this is the spending projections. This is the projected increase in the size of government in the United States. This is for federal spending. <coughs> this, again, is from the CBO. Uh, if you look at the projections, you find that by 2050, they project that, the federal, that federal spending alone in this country will consume 43% of GDP. <coughs> so on the trajectory we're currently on, Federal spending alone will take 43 cents out of every dollar produced in this country. That does not include state and local governments, which consume another 15 to 20 percent of GDP. So you're going to end up with the federal gov with government at all levels in this country consuming roughly two thirds of everything that's produced uh, in this country. Uh, I would submit you can't have a functioning economy when government is consuming two thirds of everything that's produced in this country. Uh, number three, I would suggest that the welfare state is inherently corrupt. Now, I'm not talking about the type of corruption that you get in a lot of countries where you have to pay somebody off in order to get something done, so certainly we know that goes on, the sort of thing that's measured in the general transparency indexes that are out there. I'm talking about the type of corruption that extends from the fact that you have a government who exists to distribute favors, exists to take from person A, give to person B, exists to regulate industry A, and subsidize industry B. That's why you have some 12,000 lobbyists in Washington, D.C. That is why you have trade associations and everything from the National Balloon Council to the American Asper Asparagus Growers Association uh, that are in Washington designed to try to find out how you move this around. Uh, you know, to some degree, believers in a welfare state, I think, are believers in magic. They believe that we, have, that we have to have a welfare state because basically people are corrupt. People are selfish. They're in, only out for their own self-interest. And that's why we have to have a welfare state. So what we do is we take these corrupt, self-interested, selfish individuals, and we elect them to office, whereupon they be, immediately become magnanimous and interested in only the common good and doing only what is right for society. Uh, you know, the result is that, you know, and uh, James Buchanan, of course, with uh, political economy, won a Nobel Prize for this and others. The very fact is that these institutions of government are just as self-interested as individuals, and they often operate for their own business, and that's its own form of corruption. Fourth, I would suggest the welfare state doesn't work particularly well. Uh, I think, you know, here's a simple question for you. If you hit the lottery tomorrow, and you, you know, you got your million dollars and you wanted to make, don't, you know, do something to help people because you're generally compassionate. So you want to take twenty-five or $50,000 or maybe more and you want to do something good to help people. Would you give that to a charity or would you send a check into the government? 
Now, the fact is that when it comes to things like helping the poor or helping us save for retirement or providing health care, government doesn't do a particularly good job. Uh, here's a couple of examples. Here's a couple of examples. This is annual welfare spending. Uh, you can see that it's been rising substantially. Uh, and yet, poverty levels haven't significantly changed. We spend in this country, we have 126 separate and distinct federal anti-poverty programs that cost $686 billion every year. State and local governments spend another $260 billion fighting poverty. The result is the poverty level is virtually unchanged from where it was in 1965 when we declared the war on poverty. How about Social Security, saving retirement? This just shows the relative amounts that you could have saved if you took the same amount that you're putting in Social Security taxes and then put it in the stock market uh, over the last, and retired. This is if you retired last year, so you started 40 years ago. Uh, you would have been much better off with private investment, even investment in bonds. Uh, a full bond portfolio would have done uh, for a low-income person as well as Social Security does for them. Uh, government doesn't do a very good job of providing benefits uh, as well. And the simple reason is that, as George uh, George S. Karras has said, the marginal productivity of government services may be negatively related to government size. The public sector may be more productive when small. Basically, a government that tries to do everything doesn't do anything well. A you know, tr just try and think of it managing your own life. The more you try to take on, the harder it is to do anything right. And when we have government that tries to get involved in every aspect of everybody's life, the less it actually accomplishes. I also like this quote. This is from Pope John Paul II and Centesimus Annus. I said, by intervening directly uh, in depriving society of its responsibility, the welfare state leads to a loss of human energies and an inordinate increase in public agencies, which are dominated more by bureaucratic ways of thinking than by the concern for serving their clients, and which are accompanied by an enormous increase in spending. Lastly, the welfare state is anti-freedom. The fact is that the that every dollar the welfare state takes from person A to give to person B is one less dollar that person A has to do with what they want. Uh, you know, we have to think of Frederick Bastiat, the seen and the unseen. Uh, when we take that dollar from that individual, that's a dollar that he can't educate his children with, that he can't give to charity, that he can't buy something with. And, of course, when we socialize cost in the welfare state, then the government becomes an interest in governing everything we do. If the government's going to pay for your health care, then the government has an interest in your health. They can start telling you what you can eat, how you can drink, and how you can behave. I think that, uh, and I'll close with this, Milton Friedman, quote, those of us who believe in freedom must believe also in the freedom of individuals to make their own mistakes. We may argue with them, seek to persuade them that he is wrong, but we are entitled, uh, are we entitled to use coercion to prevent him from what he, doing uh, what he chooses to do. Is there not always the possibility that he is right and we are wrong? Humility is the distinguishing characteristic of the true believer in freedom, arrogance of the paternalist, or I would suggest, of the welfare state. Thank you all very much. Our uh, equally distinguished champion of the concept of the welfare state uh, is Professor Peter Lindert who is Distinguished <coughs> Professor of Economics at the University of California, Davis. Uh, he's a graduate of Princeton <coughs> University, which warms the cockles of my heart, having just come from Princeton myself a long ago. And uh, he received his PhD from Cornell. His work has centered on the history of economic inequality, especially in the United States, and the contribution of social spending to economic growth. His most recent book is Growing Public Social Spending and Economic Growth Since the 18th Century, published by Cambridge University Press. He's also the co-author of a textbook, uh, International Economics, which is now in its 11th edition. He served as co-editor of the Journal of Economic History and also as president of the Economic History Association. Uh, and in 2007, received the Jonathan Hughes Prize for Excellence in Teaching Economic History. He's published in a great many scholarly journals, but also in some journals of public commentary. Uh, recently, uh, he published an article in The Nation magazine, Five Ways to Slander the Welfare State. I don't know if, he, if Michael's <laughs> touched on all five of them or not, but uh, we'll, uh, we'll find it. So. <laughs> Thank you, Steve.
you. Thank you, Michael, for the great marks, too. Um, delighted to be here. Uh, and I only have 15 minutes. I have to try to keep track of them. So uh, let me just plow right in, helped by a handout that I gave out to the rest of you, knowing, as Michael knew too, that at some point you've got to cut these things short if you've got the 15 minute constraint. You can see my sources and some of the arguments there. I'll come to those. Starting with uh, the big question that uh, Michael has already uh, hinted at. Uh, indeed, his closure was about freedom. Uh, that's the big question. What is the role of government in our lives? It is no secret to you that this dominates, almost tyrannizes American political debate. That's what they're talking about. We are relevant in what we're debating today, for sure. It's also in the social sciences, at least three of them. Uh, it always struck me when teaching uh, this material, you know, I can listen to a particular sub-question of sociology, political science, or econ, but really, always what they're debating is the role of government in our lives. This is it. This is big. Um, and the welfare state is a very prominent part of uh, this set of issues. I want to first give you a definition that will help. Um, Michael was Im implying this, so I think we're probably in agreement on something like this. Um, I'll define a welfare state as a democracy for which, year after year, large shares of national product, large shares of national, our national income, go to uh, these kinds of government spending. Old age pensions and disability, public health, family assistance, which is what the Americans will call uh, welfare. We actually use the term in a more narrow sense in our uh, media, etc. But um, family assistance, unemployment compensation, uh, and those four are usually the way this is defined for the most controversial part. Wait a minute, you're taking money from these people and giving it to those people. That redistribution <coughs> stuff is about one through four, usually. And I've focused on that sort of thing. You can also put in public education as well if you want to get a broader concept of social spending than is done by the uh, OECD. And if, in fact, uh, we use that kind of definition as something useful since 1980, uh, that definition of large, then here's the sort of eight countries, and sometimes it could be more than eight over that threshold, uh, that I would count as welfare states. Uh, in the case of the United States, I want to give you a hint as to what kinds of spending uh, looms largest. And also, uh, I happen to have seized upon a particular time when we got closest to it. Because, and this is an important thing to keep coming back to, I think, in this discussion, uh, when you talk about relationships of uh, growth or GDP to uh, the share of government uh, spending in these programs. My data for the United States are from the year 19, uh, 2010, and this is about as bad as it gets. This was the highest we ever got in this year, and it's bad in the sense that we're still stuck in just trying to start a recovery out of the recession of 2008-2009. So it will, shouldn't surprise us that this will give a high figure for the United States, because uh, it's precisely the way these things are supposed to work, that when you're in the slump, they're supposed to be you know, GDP has dropped and the spending is not supposed to drop as much. That's supposed to be the way it is. And I think you want to know for how we're defining all these things that the, the biggest categories are the first two, for us and for other countries. So these shares of GDP go to pensions, etc., and to public health from, through government. Those are the actual biggies. Uh, what Americans call welfare, etc., is uh, maybe only 0.7%, there's something down in the next category that might have been included, but say 1% of, of GDP. It's far smaller, so that the issues we need to face for the future are really about the pensions and public health above all. Okay, four big questions, and these correspond to ones in the handout. I will um, deal with uh, the first, second, and last of these here, cutting out the third one, or just to save time and make sure I stay within 15 minutes. Okay, the biggest one, number one here, is does the big welfare state cause um, uh, damage or help to economic growth? So my routine is that I'm an uh, economic historian, and I just like to see what the facts say. 
either just in the raw when you look at them or with statistical massaging. Okay, so let's go to question A first. And um, what I want to do, so the, my first line here is very important as a, a way to set the debate. Let's compare what, how it actually works with countries that have high spending for these social programs and countries that have very low. Let's do that and look at all the information. We've got decades of it for, for, all, for many countries. There's a lot of information out there. We don't want to go with just theories uh, or anecdotes. Okay, now when you do that, the net effect uh, is, in fact, there is zero net effect on either the level or the growth of GDP. Uh, that is the way it really stands out in the historical record. This growth game is, in fact, a tie game. Notice I didn't say, sort of uh, counter to um, uh, Michael's presentation, I'm not saying, oh, the welfare state's wonderful for growth and makes you grow faster. No, nope, that's not what the record showed me. I would have said so if it did, but it doesn't. What it shows me is tie game, basically. There is somebody who has some countries, democracies, that have high spending, some that have low spending, are doing sort of equally well as far as GDP is concerned. Okay, that tie game result is both between countries and between states of the United States. Growth or level of GDP uh, does its more generous local um, social programs make Connecticut grow more slowly than South Carolina or somebody else who doesn't uh, spend nearly as much? No, there's no difference, even either the level or the rate of change. And it doesn't matter whether or not you hold other things equal, uh, many statistical tests have tried on this question. It's hard. It's hard to find uh, a clear result, and certainly you get toward that null result that there is no clear difference. Okay, now that leads me to what I've called elsewhere a free lunch puzzle. Well, not free for everybody. Um, not free for you know some part of society who's going to end up getting less of the benefits than they pay in taxes, but for the nation as a whole, sure. Um, it is that zero result, and that's uh, the use of this phrase. And what did the countries with high spending, those eight countries in Western Europe that I showed you, what do they get for it? Just doing things differently, getting no clear net difference in the effect on their economic uh, growth. They've cut poverty and inequality more than we. See the sources that I give you. And we'll come to a diagram related to it quickly at one point. Um, better life expectancy, but I don't want to, I'm going to explain to you that, well, I, I can even say it right now. Uh, the better life expectancy is, is certainly true. We rank down the ranks in terms of life expectancy. Welfare state policies, public health, etc., is not the main reason why. It's a small player, helping to explain the differences, not the main reason. The main reason is, frankly, lifestyle. Americans sit around more, and that's what I would call the bacon double cheeseburger effect, you know, sort of thing. It's, it's mainly lifestyle. Uh, you know, it's something that's, hey, we're, we're free to choose on that issue, and we can go ahead and choose. But that is probably a biggie, uh, but I'll come back to the health programs. Uh, they have cleaner government, uh, despite the uh, often references to uh, uh, corruption. And they do this without, you heard me say, without government, bigger government budget deficits or debt. Indeed, the credit ratings of the northern European countries that are in my list is better, are better than that of the United States. The market thinks that their prospects are better for meeting their debts and for keeping the country solvent uh, than is the case for us. That did not include Greece, which is not one of you know, these the highest spending countries. Okay. Uh, most of them even rank in the business's top ratings of competitiveness. There's this World Economic Forum kind of index of competitiveness. Uh, I find it somehow, you know, a little bit arbitrary, but hey, uh, what they said when interviewing uh, business people uh, gave us this result. Okay, and these four uh, quick illustrations can show you something about this. So, with no loss of GDP, this is... I want to show you here uh, a, a quick diagram that you have in front of you anyway in, uh, in your hands. Toward the right is a higher uh, uh, spending share on these social programs, and upward is at the moment the level, not the rate of growth of GDP. Okay, now the whole world today 
is way down here. They don't, they don't spend much on the welfare state. They're far from it. The whole world is also poor. Um, that is also uh, my proxy for all the millennia of previous world history. World history doesn't have welfare states, except for, since World War II, these few countries. Uh, it's actually something new, young, um, in the broader sweep of world history. Okay, now, um, the United States and other countries, every rich country, basically, that, uh, spends a greater share on these kinds of programs. You may wish to say they're all foolish, this is incredibly bad, but that puts on you the burden of saying why every single country chooses this as soon as they get the chance and they get rich enough. They all do it. And we are not exceptional. Okay? Uh, re greater reduction of poverty. Even in absolute terms, by the way. Um, it's, if you were going to be poor, U.S. is not the best country to be poor in. But uh, those longer lifespans were here. Uh, so you see sort of up here... Um, all of us, we have better health than most of the world, by far, um, and so do these other countries. They're doing fine uh, in that respect. Now, uh, less corruption. The, they interview international businesses. You can get, go on and get the Corruption Perception and Perceptions Index, and on this graph, up is their actually uh, Clean Government Index. and. Uh, these countries are fine. Uh, they, would, they, they find it easiest and clearest uh, to deal with the countries that are uh, up in that upper right-hand corner, uh, Nordic countries, Austria, etc. The uh, United States is fine, but it doesn't beat them. How do, the, how do they do that? So I'm not just going to give you, hey, here's some, here's some data, here's some charts. Wow, look at that. There must be a reason if this is, if this is true. The answer is, yeah. You get this kind of tie game on the growth front because different advantages on different sides kind of balance out. When you look at the actual way it's done, I can think of a, a nightmare of private economy yeah, uh, that somehow got everything wrong. 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 I, I can, can think, think of a socialist, socialist you know, non-democracy. Non Forget that. that. Uh, you're you're comparing, comparing actual with actual. actual. And there, there are advantages on both sides. sides. We, we do find in a lot of aspects, sort of a free market or lower spending countries, like the United States, uh, and we should reinforce those advantages. Since we're talking here about welfare state and social sectors of the economy, then for those, uh, my, my, a quick example here, uh, some of the U.S. does better, the higher education sector. We've shown in our history, actually, a lot of finesse on this issue. We didn't just pour money on it, we spent pretty well on higher education out of uh, taxpayer money. But we make those public institutions compete against each other, right? You're always looking for a chance to get your rankings up, more research money, you're competing for better faculty, you're competing for better students, etc. And they have to compete against the privates. Berkeley has to compete not only against UCLA, but private Stanford, you know, and it's, this is the kind of social sector for which just, you, it should be a market with competition like that. There should be some government subsidies because it's uh, because of the advantages of knowledge for the country. Um, that is the, okay. Um, several advantages for the welfare states, real quick. Uh, so these are sort of alluded to. Very quickly here, first, number one, better support for mothers' careers with quality infant care. This takes the form of more generous uh, parental leave when you have a child and... Uh, infant uh, care uh, with quality uh, helped by the public sector. That combination allows women to keep career continuity. Uh, it has no negative effect that we can see on males' productivity, having this kind of help to the family at that uh, crucial phase in life. But every, you, everybody knows, and it's dramatically true today, that if you lose a job, boy, you never go back to the same track. You never recover, even when you're rehired. So. Uh, this has a, a tremendous advantage that you can see in the pay of women. Secondly, uh, for certain social services, not for most of the market economy, not for selling ice cream or anything like that, but for certain uh, services, and these are uh, the important, most important ones of these social services that we have here. Government uh, operates with greater efficiency, you heard me say it, and lower bureaucracy, lower administrative costs. You heard me say it for these things. Some quick examples. 
um, health insurance. Uh, you have been dealing with the private health insurance system. Is this bureaucracy free? Uh, they never did deny or de de delay a claim, etc. There have been lots of very careful studies of the U.S. versus Canada, Germany, etc. Uh, the cost is less if it in fact is a simple universal kind of system. Uh, other examples, they handle uh, pensions and safety nets for the poor, again with lower administrative costs, but frankly because they're more universal. And it gets simpler to say who's in and who's out. The answer is everybody's in. And so they have a very uh, simple information gathering system. You've got more on that on the handout. Okay, finally, what would need to be changed? Okay, there are two things that I want to feature that uh, need to be changed. Since we wanted to ask, uh, what would have to be changed to keep these things viable in the future? Okay, first, uh, when it comes to anything related to spending on the elderly, pensions, uh, Medicare in our, in our country, every system faces what I call the curse of long life, which is uh, the rapidly accelerating life expectancy of our seniors. It's, it's, been it's been faking out even the insurance companies and others lately, uh, just how fast their uh, life expectancy is improving. Um, that's tough for any kind of uh, commitments to the elderly. Everybody's got to face that. In fact, suppose there were no pension programs, even from your employer or the government. Suppose you just had to do all your own individual saving. It would be the same issue. Relative to your grandfather, you're going to want to and be able to live more years in retirement. You better somehow make the same kinds of adjustments that uh, Michael's already begun to talk about. So for the Social Security system, uh, you, we need to hold down the benefits growth. We need a formula uh, for doing that over time. Um, as long as more and more people are in the advanced ages, as is good, certain to be true, you can't go on having the same relationship of your pension to your annual earnings when you were working. It can't be. Something has to give. And Sweden has done this really well, uh, but the, unfortunately the uh, American debate just isn't picking up at all on a really good solution that they have. And then finally, the other thing is, Everybody has to invest more in the education of the young. Uh, James Heckman of the University of Chicago, another Nobel laureate, and others have really been finding very high rates of return to society. On preschool in particular, the U.S. is a little bit behind some other countries. We're not in a disaster state. A little bit behind other countries in uh, providing for that kind of early uh, schooling. We need to have primary schooling shape up more. Uh, I approve of certain like school choice and competitive mechanisms as being part of that. We can discuss it. And um, we have to get uh, with that. So do many of the other um, welfare states. Everybody's got to go in the same direction. The problems are not differential between these types of governments. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, have five minutes of rejoinder from each side. So I'm going to... Okay. Well, uh, don't stay away slides. I'll stay away from the slides for now. Uh, I always told them with doctors' groups you have to do slides. It's just sort of required. Uh, I just want to make a, make a couple of, of, of points here. First of all, I think you know to some degree there's a little selectivity in going on in which welfare states we're considering, which ones we're not here. These, these particularly, uh, Peter's been talking a lot about the Nordic states, which is a very small subgroup of welfare states, and some of those it's a little bit hard to, you know, for example, Norway basically lives off of North Sea of oil right now, which, you know, sort of makes it something of an outlier. But basically you have small uh, homogeneic societies uh, that have export-based economies that allow them to sort of spread the cost to other countries rather than absorbing it all themselves. But at least one of those I think actually makes my, my point, and that is Sweden. You know, in 1970, Sweden was the fourth richest country in the world. And as its welfare state grew, its economic growth declined, so that by 1993, it had fallen to 14th among the richest countries of the world. At that point, Sweden began to dramatically reduce its welfare state. It had reached 67% of GDP. Government was consuming two-thirds of everything in Sweden by 1993. 
it cut that by 18 percentage points down to, to just 49% of GDP. Still far too high in my opinion, but significant decline. And what happened? GDP grew far faster. Sweden now has a smaller welfare state than France, and if it continues on the trajectory it's on right now with some of the plans that it's, that it's made, it'll have a smaller welfare state than Great Britain. So what you actually have is a shrinking Nordic welfare state. And at the same time, they largely privatized, they privatized a portion of their social security system, their pension system. They developed, they instituted a system of private accounts for that. They dramatically liberalized labor laws. It is easier to hire and fire in Denmark and Sweden than it is in the United States. So what you actually have is a declining welfare state, I think, in the Nordic countries, which has a lot to do with their, with their relative prosperity compared to the rest of Europe. The second point I want to make is just that we should remember when we're talking about investing in these things that if we had magic money trees, it might well be a good idea to invest in these things. But we should always remember that the government has no money. The only way the government gets any money is to take it from someone else. And when it takes it from someone else, it deprives them of the ability to put that money in the economy in some way. Uh, Bastiat, in the 19th century in France, talked about this thing called the seen and the unseen. And he gave an example of, let's take a French farmer who was about to have, irrigate his crops. He was going to hire a group of workers to dig ditches, uh, <coughs> irrigation ditches on his farm, and irrigate his crops. But before he could do that, the French government comes along and takes the money he was going to use to hire those workers, and they go out and they have a project, a road building project or something, and they hire a bunch of workers over here to do that. And everyone says, yay, French government, you're hiring all these workers. Think of all the jobs you've created. Meanwhile, over here, that farmer can no longer irrigate his crops. The workers that he was going to hire to, to dig those ditches are without a job, and his crops wither in the field. When you take money out of the private sector, there is always a cost to that. Now, in some small occasions, it may be that you're using the efficiencies in the government need, or you may be willing to absorb the inefficiencies because this is something government needs to do, but you should remember that there is always a cost. And lastly, I just, I just have to quibble on one last thing on the preschool investment. Uh, in ge education in general, there's no evidence that suggests that money going into a classroom equals educational outcomes. You, 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 we have been spending more money federally on education every year. Test scores are flat. In general, if you look at uh, that Hannah Schick stuff out of the uh, uh, SUNY New York Buffalo and stuff, he finds no correlation between uh, spending and, and, and education. But particularly in preschool, there is no evidence out there that suggests that you have sustainable results from early preschool that by third grade, any results that you saw younger have dissolved. Now, you can take two cases. There's Ypsilanti and one other in which you had so much personalized investment that we could never replicate that on a large scale. You're spending like $25,000 per child, having almost a one-to-one -one teacher child ratio. <clears throat> All sorts of things that are not, not reproducible. But on a large scale, you can look to Head Start, for example, where even the GAO says it's an utter failure and does, does, does no good. Anyway, I'm just going to leave it with that. I'm sure we'll have a lot of stuff to get into the Q&A. Okay, thank you, Michael. Um, quick uh, rejoinders on the rejoinder in particular. Let's see, is there something else I needed to do? Uh, I'll, I'll not comment at the moment on the, his opening remarks. I'll stay with this uh, immediate rejoinder. Uh, no, I'm not being selective in the definition of uh, welfare states. It's simply who's spending the most. You wanted to hear about that, and that is how it's defined uh, in a consistent way as to who are the welfare states. The, um, Norway is the only one that has the oil, uh, so that there is no, there's no selectivity here. It's simply on uh, size of uh, the spending. Uh, in Sweden, um, Michael is selective in his choice of a period to tell you about. He says, oh, let me tell you about Sweden from 1970 to 1990. Yeah, that'll do it. Um, he gets them going from 4th to 14th, uh, which is to say that some other countries uh, did better. Uh, in, in my books, uh, I have also written about that particular era, 1970s and 80s for Sweden, where they uh, got a little bit in, it wasn't so much in spending, but in uh, just the institutions of uh, capitalism, etc., where they were getting too far left, they themselves pulled in on that. And by the 1990s, uh, they came out of uh, all
all this. So he's picked the, uh, the one period in which they uh, you know, uh, were making their reforms of, uh, and had their moment of uh, aberrant behavior. 1930 up to 1970. Starting in 1930, they had zero welfare state. They were much farther behind the United States and others then. They got closer during the period of the most rapid growth of the welfare state as a share of the economy or any, measured any other way, in 1930 up to 1970. When they're growing fastest, no, they were actually catching up, not falling behind. And uh, since the 1990s, they've done fine. Watch out with the selection of dates. Because, and I've seen others try to write about this, say, oh, look, if I start from the early 1990s and I go to a more, any more recent normal year, what I'm going to find is those which had their uh, government share on these kinds of things drop most, grew fastest. Well, wait a minute. I would hope that was true because in the early 1990s, countries with a deep slump, like, the, uh, like Finland and Sweden were among them because they were foolishly pegged into the mark and things like that. They had bad exchange rate policies, too. At a moment like that, I would hope, at least momentarily, <laughs> that they had a high uh, spending share, simply because GDP is down and you're trying to cushion uh, the GDP. So they grow out of it, and lo and behold, as they grow out of it, that comes uh, away. Remember the problem here about uh, the selective use of correlations. To say that when you're in a slump, you have the, you, this high GDP share of the economy, okay? That's like saying that people's putting up umbrellas causes the rain, okay? Or that people's going to the hospital uh, and where they proceed to die shows you that the hospitals are doing such a bad job. Shame on Mayo Clinic, etc. No, get the correlation uh, carefully interpreted. Labor laws liberalized. Yes, I'm, I'm with him on this. It is not welfare state. It is not welfare state to have a special interest lock up the economy. Any more than it's the, uh, a welfare state to have the oil industry have, a, have special breaks, so also it's not a welfare state to have senior male laborers so locked up with the anti-firing laws that they have in the Mediterranean, and that, as you rightly said, uh, the, the uh, northerners are a little more light-footed. Germany, Denmark, and others, uh, they saw the problem. They get the, the different parties together, they agree on this, and they, uh, they have liberalized their markets. It's Italy, Spain, and the others where it's so hard for young adults ever to stop living with mom and papa into their 30s because they are stuck, they are not insiders. The more you protect the, the insiders against firing, and they're older and senior and older industries, etc., uh, the more you as a firm will not want to hire. And that's the problem for the young adults. They're stuck, and it's more, it affects women more than men, too. Okay, finally, on his uh, preschool, let's see, oh, he has a labor crowding out. Uh, I, don't, I don't believe that, but uh, we can get into that. On preschool, uh, he cites Rick Hanischek and others that don't, that show you that uh, money doesn't work. Uh, Hanischek has made a career out of this uh, at Stanford, at Hoover Institution. And uh, his work is of good standards. Uh, he does a good job statistically. There is uh, importance to it in the sense that he's showing you that in much of the American setting in particular, he also does some international, um, there's been a stalling out uh, in the productivity of some existing school programs. Um, I believe that. Uh, he's also being selective, though, in what he emphasizes, because in other cases, like in excuse me, the earlier developments of school systems, etc., they did get the payoff. And the preschool, etc., is not anything that he discussed. Michael is hinting at something correct, which is that the empirical base for Heckman, Carniero, and others to say preschool has this high rate of return is thin. Uh, it's based on only a few studies, etc. Okay. The, opposi the op opposition to it is based on none, because Hanischek stuff, etc., is not really coming to grips with this issue. Uh, this looks... Um, like it has some considerable basis. We need to do more on it. And finally, that Head Start didn't work. Uh, Head Start had a couple of issues. One, the way in which they measured your third grade kind of thing. Um, they, it was hard for them to panel all the way into the uh, adulthood. But a more a fundamental problem with Head Start, the people doing the preschool education, the early uh, child care, etc., were not the best. It was a, they were using uh, local community-based uh, mamas 
who are themselves, in many cases, welfare moms, etc., to be the caretakers and the instructors, etc., it's, yeah, a system, you might say, see, this kind of stuff doesn't work. Answer, it doesn't work if you do it badly, as they did in that case. Okay, let's, uh, let's throw it open to the floor here. Um, but let me start with a student before we get. Let's, let's have as, as a first question. If there's a student out there um, who would like to ask a question, a student. Do we have a student bold enough to ask a question? Right here. Okay. When I was looking at your graph, uh, basically it had a lot of fluctuations. I think it was on GDP and, right. and spending. Put up my slide. Or actually, no, it was the second, it was the first slide you had. It basically was like the, I don't know if you can bring yeah, it. Yeah, the red and blue. Well, it, it was going to, and it suddenly went like this, you know, like at the very end. Like, how can you, like, be so sure that it'll just go like that and not continue to fluctuate like it had in the past? Sure. It's, it's essentially because it would be driven now by demographics. The, uh, uh, Peter's right, when we moved away from the, it's not, the social welfare spending component that is driving the, the deficit and debt going forward. It is essentially demographics. As the society ages, the essentially the health care program for the elderly and the pension program for the elderly are, are the key components that are driving this forward. You know, as you can, you know, we have a pretty good idea of what demographics in, in the future. It's not the contracyclical stuff that we're talking about. It's not that unemployment benefits go up when unemployment changes. Uh, the amount of contracyclical effort in the Social welfare programs is debatable. Uh, you can actually look at food stamps, for example, or TANF programs versus unemployment, and they don't match as well as you might think. Uh, but there's certainly a certain amount of that that goes in. The, the programs we have essentially, the welfare state we have in the United States is essentially a middle class welfare state. It's not a welfare state for the poor, it's a welfare state essentially for the middle class. And that's what's being driven in the future, and that's what I think is unsustainable. <laughs> thank, thank you. I can use the mic since I'm standing right here anyway. Thank you both for good presentations. And uh, I worry a little bit, and you're starting to converge when you went back and forth of talking about the same thing, but you were almost defined around each other when we got started. Because we have a welfare state that are the things that Peter listed. We also live in a corporate welfare state and a warfare welfare state, and all sorts of these transfers going on. Whether this is sustainable or not depends how many of those things we're going to lump into this category. And Michael tended to define it expansively as talking about government spending, budget deficits, and including entitlement growth, and Peter tried to narrow it down to just those four components. So I'm wondering maybe if you guys could address that directly with each other, uh, particularly Michael in the context of, do you believe Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid at a 20-25% level of GDP is sustainable, and what changes would it take in that to make that sustainable? And Peter, do you think the welfare state, as defined in the United States right now, of your four things, is sustainable in the context of the rest of the welfare, corporate and warfare welfare state that we live in? Yeah, I mean, I, look, the, the, as I said, I was just explained, the welfare state in the United States is largely a middle class welfare state. If you look at where, of every dollar of federal spending, 44 cents of that dollar goes to Medicare, Medicaid, or Social Security. Uh, you know, you can throw in uh, another seven cents or so that goes to interest on the debt, and you're already over half the spend. Uh, you know, Republicans love to go around and say, let's kill Big Bird and do away with Planned Parent federal fund to Planned Parenthood, and maybe we'll kill foreign aid along the way, and that'll solve our budget problems. The fact is, foreign aid is 1% of federal spending. Planned Parenthood and Big Bird combined are one half of, uh, I'm sorry, five one hundredths of a percent of federal spending. You know, you ain't going to get there from here. Uh, the, the big problems are, are the entitlement programs that are being driven, and no, they're not sustainable. I mean, uh, uh, you can't provide the current level of benefits, uh, and you can't tax people at a level big enough to, to do that. So you're going to have to reduce benefits in the future, which I think by definition means a smaller welfare state. I mean, I, I'm not arguing that you'll have a zero welfare state. I might, on other grounds, prefer that. But, I, but we're not going to see that. But we're not going to have the welfare state we have today in the future. And correct me if I didn't pick up all parts of the question that you meant to uh, send my way. <clears throat> the, this is all sustainable with changes that are specific to what is being delivered to the elderly over this 21st century. Changes have got to be made. I've been saying so for years. Uh, 
the demographic threat is the biggest of all. And certain countries have done spending which is unfortunately too much uh, tilted toward great power in the elderly. The three that I can most easily cite are Japan, Italy, and Greece. And there's a very fine study by a Julia Lynch, poli sci at Penn, uh, where she's really shown which countries tilt their social spending toward the elderly the most. And there are four outliers. I just told you three, Japan, Italy, Greece. The fourth is the United States. In our case, I would argue, it's because we're not doing well enough for the rest of society. This goes largely, okay, I'll complete that thought and get back to your sustainability long run. This goes uh, largely back to some fascinating uh, historical traps that we got into on health insurance. Starting in the 1940s and 50s, now Milton Friedman was uh, one of the ones who first pointed out a difficulty we got into. We were trapped into having this uh, relationship of social, um, uh, sorry, of, uh, health insurance to your job. It's not portable, and worst of all, it doesn't help you after you're completely retired. The retirees panicked and had power in the 1960s. They gave us a potentially efficient unified social system, but oops, you had to be over age 65 to be in it. The most expensive possible group for extending each extra year of life. Uh, and we got trapped. And uh, very hard to reform that. Something has to change there, and we can go into that further. But you asked about the long-run sustainability. I certainly agree, and I have said so. It's not that I'm agreeing or conceding. I've always said so. Uh, look, you have got to have a formula whereby the annual amount you get in old age of this kind of aid does not go up as fast as the average earnings of people who are at work. It can't, just because of the age group shares in society. There are just going to be too many elderly. It can't go on that way. It's got to grow more slowly. It doesn't have to be cut in the sense of drop today. But, but must grow more slowly. The Swedes have got it right. Even the concession offered by Obama on the chain link index uh, this week, etc., it's just not getting at the issue. The American debate has not picked up on a formula for doing this. It's just sort of Republican, oh, privatize, we'll solve everything, versus um, the Democrats saying, let's talk and try, and try not to touch our Social Security. We, uh, the American debate is kind of discouraging. Well, I'm sorry, but uh, a welfare state, it's a, sure, good state, sustainable. Uh, many of them have done it. Uh, they're, they're on the right track. To repeat, their whole prospect for running into deficits, etc., either when you talk about just these programs or the entire government, they, the market agrees they're on a better uh, trajectory than we are. Yeah, at the end of your... Your rebuttal, you made the point that, yeah, yeah okay. that, that um, it's hard to get it work because it wasn't done properly. But isn't that the problem most times that the government spends money, we just don't tend to spend it in the most awful way? Um, uh, I would argue that's not, uh, so if you want to take our country or the higher welfare state, in either cases, that's not more clearly true. Uh, than it is for the private sector, which you know has its own uh, difficulties too. The, uh, and if you want specifically to talk about the early education, um, in the Nordic environment, let's see now, the data I remember best are from Sweden, but it's true of the others, uh, and it's probably the Netherlands as well, is that um, the, the public <laughs> child care facilities, which is I think uh, the kind of thing you're interested in, and Education and child care are mixed before the age of five, right? It's the same kind of uh, product. Uh, they, the average qualifications, educational qualifications of those caregivers is slightly above the national average in terms of education and training and things like that. Uh, they're good. It, it can be done well if you get, um, you know, uh, society willing to put uh, good qualified people into that uh, particular task. It is being done well. Thank you. Uh, you uh, oh, sure. Okay, gentlemen, both of you guys, I, I want to commend you both. Professor, my question is, building off that young man, if the individual can more um, efficiently ration that um, whatever that unit of value is, is it not at least better to have vouchers, say, where you're having government infusion, where somebody may not have government money, or pardon me, private money of their own, and you seem to be alluding to that in terms of 
certain dynamics, competition? Uh, yes, uh, certainly there are certain things that an individual do better. That is a majority of the economy. That's a majority of the economy in welfare states, these democracies. You know, they give most of it to the market. They're actually quite careful about that. Um, and they haven't had a race. They didn't chase all the capitalists away and things like that. They were actually quite subtle, and they showed some finesse in doing that. And in general, hey, go ice cream, pizza, etc. What do I? I don't want the government spending on this uh, in any particular uh, way. I guess you give, if you give food stamps to somebody, they could buy ice cream or pizza. But basically, no. It's a, it's a private market. It should be. Most of the economy should be. Uh, all of these uh, cases that we're talking about agree on that. And also, uh, see, I had another variation on yes. Um, oh, yeah, school choice, etc. Uh, I'm, I'm, see, I'm a bit for that. Uh, and notice the interesting alliance in American politics, which you get uh, in favor of more school choice is general conservatives, religious conservatives, and African Americans. Um, quite outspoken in favor of the extra school choice, etc. Uh, and on the other side, of course, teachers' unions. Um, and many others who probably just legitimately think it doesn't work. Um, I tend to be for it. There's an interesting dilemma that I'd uh, like you people to think about. And we, I had a discussion at Duke. I, I don't think it was with Michael Longer, maybe with one of his colleagues who's uh, a real expert on uh, education, etc. Uh, there's an interesting kind of tension that uh, conservatives will want to work out here. On the one hand, much of the world does have school choice. Well, first of all, by the way, in higher education, we have it, right? And we have sovereign consumers, and they fill out course evaluations. And it's, you know, the market's fine uh, at the higher level. At the uh, ordinary levels of education, Netherlands, my favorite example, but Sweden, Denmark, uh, France, and a fifth, I don't think of it at the moment, uh, all have a growing component of school choice. The vouchers go with you, yes. But now, for the conservative American, here's the issue. It's probably, oh, I'm sorry, another, another uh, best example in favor of vouchers is if the existing condition of your schools is a total shambles, you're going to like vouchers. Well, <laughs> Cleveland, Milwaukee, you know, great, you know, I would, I got to vote for vouchers, given what they had as the only, apparently, politically viable alternative. Okay, now, but here's the thing for conservatives. Uh, what kind of schools will this go to? You say, well, it'll go to private, religious-based, church-based schools. Uh, you know what the political solution is going to have to be like in America. It's like what it is in those European countries I just referred to. Uh, uh, hang on, we're not giving taxpayer money to madrasas. The, the Muslim uh, fundamentalist uh, group. We're not giving it to a David Koresh Academy. We're not giving it to a whole bunch of other things. There's going to be serious uh, a political deal whereby the money and the taxpayer consent is going to have to be traded for what, in, like in the Netherlands, what they have is a highly, uh, in, in their case, even a national exam-oriented curriculum and a curriculum that's highly secular. On Friday afternoon, you can teach Judaism, Dutch Reform, whatever you want. But and that's, uh, as, as the colleagues at Duke were saying, that, that's a very interesting tension. How are you going to work that out? If I can, real quickly, yeah. they've already started to work out with the faith-based community in terms of charity delivery. Mm -hmm. You bifurcate that which is sectarian from that which is secular, and you have a curriculum. Well, that, that's, that's a problem, though, as, as I've written on. I think one of the problems with the whole faith-based initiative was it required <coughs> you to not be a faith-based institution to get faith-based funding. Uh, and, and, and I think that getting the ch churches entangled with the state is, is a bad way. I do think there's a move away now, away for exactly this, this reason, away from pure vouchers to more something like a tuition tax credit program like they have in Arizona and some of the moves there uh, to, to move away from this idea of the state having to have some sort of controls over where the vouchers go. Uh, the second part of this is the rise in the, much of the world of for-profit education. And I read uh, James Tooley's book, The Beautiful Tree, uh, about uh, the rise, particularly in a lot of the third world, uh, of for-profit education and what that's doing. Uh, I think that's going to modernize the school choice movement in a great deal. Um, so you both commented on the effect of the welfare state on economic growth. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, Casey Mulligan's uh, redistribution recession, where he shows that programs like changes in unemployment insurance appear to have had a significant effect on uh, unemployment and growth rates in the recent recession. Do you have any 
thoughts about that? I haven't seen, for myself, I haven't seen this paper by Casey. I know him, and we've discussed these issues. Um, it's part of a book he's, he's just brought out. Okay. Um, the changes in unemployment compensation were? Uh, Increase. huh? Increasing. Increasing. Yeah, it appeared to have significantly contributed to the high unemployment rates and lower growth rates. Uh, well, I, I, you know, I wouldn't need to comment on the latest recession for that. Um, of all the different social uh, programs, unemployment compensation, a, a tiny share of the total of what they're spending on, uh, that one is the one with some slight but significantly, statistically significant, uh, reduction in how fast uh, the person gets rehired. Um, and it, it, like I say, it could be a, a reverse causation problem like with the umbrellas and the rain, but, it, but in general, I have, in, in my past writings, I've accepted that there is something where there is a little bit of, in the statistical evidence, what some people made a lot of, which is that somebody may decide to hold off before getting a new job because they've got the unemployment comp. Yeah, yeah that happens. It, it, um, yeah, I think a lot depends on the level. In the United States, we have fairly low levels of unemployment benefits, so, that it, so I think the effect is increased somewhat, although... I think that generally the, the argument is it's, it's about eight to ten weeks slower uh, of getting a job, and it's about one half percent uh, on the unemployment rate that, that the extended unemployment benefits have. But if you look to some of the countries in Europe uh, where you can get 100 percent of your pre-retirement wages and you can get them for five or ten years, I think then you're starting to see significant impacts on, on employability. Uh, I, I had another thing on the. Um the for-profit schools, et cetera, but if somebody else wants to flow closer to this question. Okay. No. You see, yeah. Yes, uh, my question is for uh, Dr. Tanner. Uh, do, you, do you think, Dr. Tanner, that there is a significant or sufficient similarities between European economies and the American economy to make these comparisons, uh, specifically because of the uh, American phenomenon of people, be, uh, of welfare as a way of life, which I don't think we see in Europe? Oh, I, I think you see welfare as a way of life in, in Europe, probably substantially worse than the, the United States. Uh, I, I do think there are differences between the two countries. I mean, the sheer shy size of the American economy, I think, makes a difference between some, over some of these, both for good or bad. I mean, I think some of the bad things in Greece have been exaggerated because Greece is a small economy, and I think some of the good things in Sweden that we just heard about are exaggerated because they're a small economy. The U.S. is such a big economy that I think that it... That it it doesn't swing as widely uh, one way or the other. The other is the fact that we have an independent currency, and I think the euro has been a disaster. Uh, sweet, in fact, Sweden's out of the euro has, has helped them, I mean, and, and stuff like that. I think that those, the euro has just really complicated the ability of these countries to deal with their problems and made it much, much worse. So is your answer yes and no? Uh, <laughs> my, my, my answer is that is that I think that you can make too much of comparisons between the two countries, uh, the two sets of countries. That said, I think you can, I think that you can look at essentially OECD countries and measure changes between all of them and bearing in mind that they're not, none, that no countries are going to be identical, I think you can, you can estimate, you know, say trends in a certain direction tend to lead to certain results. Um, can I divert us for a minute and on to health care? Um, and could each of you speak to the abil well, the lack of ability of government to negotiate uh, Medicare, specifically pre prescription drug costs, and what part are institutions and political institutions, especially in this country, playing in this health care um, issue, and, and what changes need to be made in terms of the political institutions to facilitate um, better <coughs> transparency and and. Sure. Two, two, different, two different questions. On the prescription drug negotiations, I don't think we, in this country, I don't think we would get almost anything in additional lower cost from allowing the government to negotiate, in part because the government won't do what's necessary to actually negotiate lower prices, which is to limit the availability of drugs within each therapeutic class. People often compare Medicare to the VA and say the VA gives lower drug costs they, because they strictly limit. You get one drug in each therapeutic class and you're the low bidder that you get to be in. Medicare, we're not going to do that because seniors will scream as soon as we say, oh, no, they don't have one drug available for, high, for high cholesterol. I said, no, 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 you get them all, and as long as they're not going to limit the number of drugs, they really have very little negotiating power. And CBO looked at this, 
uh, when it, which brought up, consistently come back and said, no, you're not going to achieve any particular saving. And the second thing I've talked about the institutions, I would argue the problem in this country is that we have no market in health care. Uh, you know, you look at health care in this country, 52 cents out of every health care dollar is actually paid for by the government. 37 cents additionally is subsidized by the government through an employer-provided uh, system that provides uh, subsidies for employer-provided health care. Only 13 cents is actually paid for by the consumer. We have insurance cartels that are protected by, by laws that prevent people from shopping around for insurance. Uh, we have uh, provider cartels that are protected by licensing laws that prevent non-physician professionals from it. I mean, we have very little in the way of a market here. And so we shouldn't be surprised. You know, consumers are not spending their own money, and providers have no interest in providing the, be the, lowest, uh, the best quality at the lowest cost. Uh, you know, not surprised that we don't have much transparency in that market. Uh, so prescription drugs, and the second, uh, well, I'll, I'll start with uh, what, uh, Michael's second part of his response. Um, we have uh, more reliance on private markets than any other wealthy country when it comes to health insurance and health care. Um, these things are hard to measure exactly, but uh, we know that certainly for administrative costs and possibly with, and, and with some hints about life-saving results, especially re regarding infants, people under 65 for sure, um, they get better performance than we, and that uh, all the uh, ratings say that. So uh, just to say, well, we need to have uh, much more market, you know, um, uh, not clear. Uh, on prescription drugs, and not just prescription drugs, but also the other uh, care given to uh, Medicare, etc., uh, it would be okay if the, uh, the government had... Um, some voice in uh, was able to make some limited use of its power for that. Uh, we do pay way more. We are the outlier in the cost of prescription drugs. The only country that gets a little bit close is another provider, uh, which is a manufacturer, which is Switzerland. Uh, everybody else is, spends way less than us. And the rest of the world, you know, when, when interviewed, they said, "Gee, uh, you know, they, they one of their biggest concerns is traveling to the United States." Because the, uh, it's, a, it's a whopping cost to them uh, if they get uh, seriously sick. Um, I have, you know, there are things I could say wrong about uh, health care in almost any country. By the way, people are surveyed, you know, in all the, the rich countries as to, hey, how much do you like your health care? Nobody's cheery, right? We're talking health care here. <laughs> We're talking health care. This is about pain, suffering, death. How cheery do you expect the responses to be? Uh, but in the 1990s and early 20s, uh, the U.S. was, uh, you know, like nine countries interviewed, we would be like seventh in happiness with our system, you know, sort of thing. It's, you know, uh, health care is the nastiest, toughest. Uh, you, would, you really ought to make a career out of health care economics. That, that is just a fascinating uh, subject if you like complexity. Uh, I'll stop there on this one. I still have some things that let, let me do we got this is the area I think we've got some, some significant disagreements on, so this could be fun. First in terms of the, uh, which is more market oriented uh, healthcare system, I would suggest that actually there are other countries that are more market oriented. Switzerland is, is one in particular. The Swiss pay far more out of pocket than than, than uh, Americans do. They have a, they have a system that's entirely privately owned health insurance. It's not employer provided. It's all individually purchased. The Swiss government essentially subsidizes people to play in the private market, uh, and then does some risk reallocation, uh, sort of ex post risk reallocation. But but essentially it's a private market. The Netherlands recently adopted the Swiss system. It seems to be working fairly well there, although their subsidies are much higher than the Swiss system is still very well. Even in France. Uh, French pay more out of pocket than the United States do. Uh, and while they have capital controls that affect the hospitals and so on, physician care, physicians can balance bill. Uh, there's no price controls on physician, what physicians charge you. There's a, basically the government reimburses at a, at a particular rate, but physicians are, are free to charge any rate they want more than the government reimburses, which is how they avoid a lot of the rationing by Q that goes on there. In terms of outcomes, I would suggest the two outcomes you hear mentioned a lot. Life expectancy is essentially meaningless. The life expectancy difference between Utah and Nevada is three years, uh, which is bigger than the life expectancy difference, say, between the UK and the US. Uh, the reason is, is lifestyle related. It's, it's primarily that. Uh, in terms of low birth weight babies, the, uh, a lot has to do with definitions. 
uh, and abortion rates, uh, whether you abort uh, children, uh, babies with the difficulties they're going to make them die you know, after the birth and stuff, which is done in a lot of countries more readily than here, and definitions of what constitutes a stillbirth versus a lot of that's accounted for now. I, I would suggest if you want to look at outcomes, look at, you know, survivability rates, 5, 10, 20, 25 years survivability rates for, say, cancer, heart disease, pneumonia, AIDS. Uh, we, we see the world on all of those things. Now, we do it at a high cost. We spend a third more than any other country in the world, but I do think, you know, you know look, if you're sick, you know, where do you, when Silvio Berscaloni needed, you know, heart trend surgery, uh, you know, because bouncing around with all those 18-year-old models who had a taxi. Uh, so, he, you know, he didn't stay in an Italian hospital or go to Sweden or go to the UK or whatever. He, he went to the Cleveland Clinic. You know, there's a reason for that. Yeah. And if I were in the Saudi royal family, I would definitely want to go to Mayo Clinic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, one last question, and then we'll have our closing comments. Um, uh, I have a question, two related questions in terms of definition. Why is Japan not considered a welfare society when it has a lot of the things that we have? And why, I won't ask about South Korea, which I think we have the same. And then if you go to Costa Rica, Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay, they have life expectancies. Uh, infant mortality that are as good as or better than ours. And so at what point do, if you will, those nations fall out of the rank or why aren't they in the rank? Uh, so did you, were you able to hear his question? It was uh, why Japan, South Korea, Southern Korean countries, you know, uh, have, uh, well, why are they in? or not welfare states, why do they have the differences in life expectancy? Uh, Japan is a good case for illustrating two things. One, the importance of lifestyle. Uh, Japan is the world standard for long life, uh, the, the, and has been for a long time. Uh, lifestyle has got to be a large part of it. They, you know, they, do, they put a lot into a healthy diet, um, they sit less than we do, and they uh, have a lot of cleanliness hang-ups, which are helpful. Um, Japan is a, is, you know, now there's gradations of welfare state as to how much you spend. They will spend on some of these things a bit more than us. Their health care system is a tad more public than ours. But uh, they're just, they're kind of in the middle of the pack. And you notice that in none of this did I ever mention Britain, too, which is also in the middle of the pack. These are kind of, you know, somewhere up that spectrum, not an extreme case. Um, South Korea... Uh, no, I don't have a clue. I'm drawing a blank on South Korea, too. Uh, Southern Cone countries, uh, do, of course, do not have a better life expectancy than Japan or the heavy spending welfare states. They haven't do better than the U.S. The U.S. on infant is, uh, mortality has a particular problem. Again, this goes back to our fateful health insurance history. We give uh, the, the money to people older than 65, and what our, our, our Achilles heel, our disadvantage, is in basic, simple, out-clinic, preventative stuff, and even in talking about lifestyle. We're still a little bit hung up on telling people, hey, you know, uh, do you really need the double latte, etc. Uh, that's kind of a more American issue. It's not about markets as such. Well, it's... I, I, I think we're, we're, we're coming to our close. I do want to remind you again, if you can fill out those questionnaires, that a very illuminating way, I think you'll all agree. Uh, let me start with uh, Michael on his closing statement, and, and then we'll have a statement from you. In about three minutes. Uh, I, I would just suggest that belief that we can somehow get the welfare state right, and we can get all the balance of special interests right, and we can spend the right amount of money to improve everyone's life is a little bit like what Groucho Marx said about second marriages, the triumph of hope over experience. <laughs> the fact is that we have created a welfare state in the United States, smaller than in some other countries, larger than in others. But we have a welfare state, you know, we talk a lot about investing in Washington. Government needs to invest more. 
Only about 13% of all federal spending is actually anything that could even be remotely considered investment, like infrastructure or even education, things like that. The vast majority of it is simply transfers, taking money from person A and moving that over and giving it to person B, which creates no new wealth. If you simply take money out of my pocket, put it in someone else's pocket, nothing has been created. There's no new wealth, no growth that comes from that. And the more our welfare state grows, the more it is going to crowd out any sort of actual investment and more it's simply going to become a matter of transfers. And, when you t and in the future, you know, we are in a situation where assume that taxes go back to their normal 18 to 20 percent of GDP, which is what the historic average is since World War II. By about 2030, we'll be in a position where Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, and interest on the debt consume every penny of those taxes, leaving zero for investment. So I would suggest that ultimately, unless we reduce dramatically the welfare state we have, we're not going to see a growing economy, more prosperity, and fewer people who need the welfare state. Thank you. Three quick uh, final comments. Uh, thank you for, by the way, great questions. Uh, yeah. Very terrific questions. Uh, on Groucho, on crowding out, and then uh, back to um, for profit schools and the market for schools. Uh, it was a very important lesson for history. Uh, Groucho's uh, description of the triumph of hope over expectations is a perfect description of those who believe free markets can cure cancer, improve your sex life, etc., and assure world peace. Uh, it, it's just uh, things can be overdone on one side or the other. Um, crowding out, uh, Michael way overdoes. This is the notion that for every one uh, this that you uh, the government spends money on, you take away one from somewhere else in the economy. Wrong. Uh, that's not been uh, borne out many times. I actually close with something related to the crowding out, which is the issue of free markets and education. Here's an example of exactly how when you actually have a certain amount of government spending on something, yes, you raise the size of the pie. In fact, one of the reasons that uh, public education was number five in my list was because it's the least controversial. Everybody knows that you get a net gain from having the government involved in that in the past and in the present. Uh, I and others have studied this a lot. And here are some people who realize that, in fact, you get a gain by investing in human beings so that they can have this extra knowledge and extra skills, which uh, outrides any loss on the private side. Three people. Person number one, Adam Smith. Always said, we need to have the government involved in using taxes for mass public schooling. Person number two, Thomas Jefferson, the same. And he was defeated in Virginia on this issue, uh, where they did go ahead and subsidize universities, but not the mass schooling uh, at the time. And person number three, Milton Friedman. And the school vouchers, etc. cetera. Uh, and Friedman uh, goes on it, uh, almost a chapter on the civilizing benefits of having some limited, <coughs> you'll stress limited, uh, tax money being spent on um, keeping your kid from being a punk and getting him more civilized, etc., so that he doesn't throw rocks through my window. Uh, he was very clear on citizenship and the prevention of crime and other knowledge benefits of using taxes to fund the <coughs> Well, I think we've got a very...